Hi, my name is Doug Zucker. I'm with the FANG. I'm the banking chair. This is the asset management, banking, and insurance chapter meeting, monthly meeting for FANG. And it is my pleasure to introduce Stephen Van de Wettering, founder and CEO of Impaxis Data Management. Stephen, take it away. Great. Thanks, Doug. And thanks, Joyce, uh, for having me on today. Um, uh, so I was asked to give a presentation about uh, financial technology, FinTech, and um, uh, my thoughts around that. And so we put together these slides and, uh, you know, I have some stories to share about my experience in working in this space and some of the challenges that we've overcome and some of the stories that might be helpful to some of you um, in the process of working in investment operations. Uh, but I wanted to thank Joyce and, and Doug for having me here. Uh, I'm excited to do this presentation. So let's move on to our next uh, slide. We're going to, um, this, this is an open call. So I know you have a text or chat available to you. If you have questions, just, just uh, put it into the chat. Doug will read those out to me. And uh, you know, we, can, we can answer those as we go. So don't, don't hesitate. Uh, we'll we'll have, definitely have a Q&A session at the end, but uh, feel free to just stop along the way and uh, ask questions. So the areas that we're going to cover today are areas around, uh, you know, points to cover around opportunities where you can leverage fintech, and and um, these these uh, bullets were in the um, the initial material that we sent out. Uh, so it's it's just really going to be I don't want to call it a rambling, but it's going to be more of a conversational piece of hey, how do I see fintech? How do we leverage fintech? You know, what is fintech? We'll talk a little bit about that. What are some of the exciting areas that we see happening in fintech and areas that you could leverage in your investment operation? Um, and some of the practicalities of, um, you know, being the one that's responsible for financial technology in your firm. Uh, so that's what we're going to be going over today. So just a little bit about me. Uh, as Doug mentioned, I founded uh, Impaxis Data Management. I used to work at, at Pacific Life and PIMCO, admin software, all in operations, right? I was either doing operations, starting at the bottom, reconciling data, back office grunt work, um, you know, from working with the, the smallest firms to the largest firms. So uh, I started Impaxis in two, 2004 really to help small to medium sized firms with their operation, providing outsourced services for them. Uh, nowadays, we also provide uh, a whole platform for, for them to, for investment advisors to log into. This is for hedge funds and family offices and wealth managers, what have you. And we also do a lot of automation services. Automation services are application development, um, building tools to facilitate uh, work in an organization, you know, trying to have a, a computer do the work rather than people do the work. Um, uh, but that's, that's uh, a little bit about me. And this, this, uh, this session is, is really for designed for small and medium sized asset manager, wealth manager, buy side investment firms, right? Uh, so not really designed in uh, talking, probably the content isn't so great if you are at a mega firm or a really large firm, although who knows, you might pick up something uh, along the way. Um, but the other reason we're doing this session is because, look, I don't want my friends to make the same mistakes. And um, when, you know, I'm, a, I'm an expert, which means that basically I've made all the mistakes in a very narrow field. So I'm trying to prevent people from going through some of the challenges that I had to go through in the, in the process of running operations for small firms, big firms, and helping lots of uh, other firms uh, with their operations. So one of the themes that you're going to pick up on uh, that I, I feel personally very strong about is simplicity. Um, investment operations are, are actually fairly complicated. Uh, a small, medium-sized investment firm will have maybe eight to 10 different core systems, not to mention systems like email and backups and all those kinds of things. So when you think about that, each one of these systems requires a certain amount of overhead beyond just using the system itself. You need, you have contract dates with those uh, systems. You have to pay their bills. 
you have to uh, maybe integrate with that system, get data out of it and use it with data from another system. There's just, uh, you know, there's, there's servers that the system runs on, which are, you know, complicated in and of itself. So uh, for small to medium sized firms, I think the biggest takeaway, if you took nothing away, uh, nothing else away from today's presentation, the biggest takeaway should be, you should always try to be simplifying. There's just, you know, in this day and age, there's the compression happening in the industry. Technology is changing really fast. There's lots of new things that you hear about in the industry. And when you have so many little things that you need to manage, it, it takes a lot of your sort of just mental mind share. So the more you can simplify your operation, the better served you'll be, right? Um, already you have lots of hats to wear. Uh, the last thing you need to be worrying about or thinking about is the nth system that you've decided to integrate with um, that uh, you know just breaks down because of, uh, of something else, which cascades into lots of other problems. So if you've learned nothing else, think about simplifying. That should be your default MO as you approach an investment, you know, dealing with your investment operations, whether you're managing them or whether you have a separate group managing them. You should be always thinking to simplify. The other, uh, you know, one thing I, I forgot to point out is um, when it comes to complicated, more complicated setups, adoption is very, very difficult. It just becomes harder. And um, when you simplify, you have less systems to work with. It's easier to get more people to adopt them. It's just simpler, right? There's just, you know, uh, less moving parts to have to learn. Okay. Um, so let's talk about FinTech and what we think about uh, when we think about FinTech. FinTech can be anything financial technology re related. Uh, usually my mind goes to software because there's zillions of applications out there uh, that go into financial technology. This could be your portfolio accounting system. This could be your trading system, risk system, financial planning, uh, what have you. It could also be cloud computing, your hardware and the technology associated with hardware, right? Um, so there's, it, it's kind of an all encompassing area. There's a couple areas that I really like to focus on for FinTech as it relates to investment managers and investment operations. And the first is data warehousing. Data warehousing uh, is the, a tool in which you can take lots of data, pull it into one source. So as I mentioned before, investment managers have lots of different systems they work with, right? Trading, financial planning, risk, what have you. When it comes to reporting, it's difficult to report on information that's spanning across multiple systems. A data warehouse is a great tool to help you with this. Okay, it's a one a way, one place where you can have all your data live, and enables you to pull, you know report across multiple systems. So, um, when you think about uh, having all these systems, a lot of systems that you uh, may look at in in the market they claim to integrate There's, you know, they'll integrate with another system that you have or a whole bunch of different systems that you have. Um, integration, in, in your mind, you think, oh, they all talk with each other. The reality is they don't talk that well to each other. So when you think about this challenge, um, one of the prime challenges I hear all the time from investment advisors is that they have these different systems and they have to enter name and address information into each one. So they have five different systems, they enter name and address information into five systems. A data warehouse helps you solve this problem. So data warehousing enables you to put all your information into one spot and then that can be the spot that pushes out information. You report out so you can have an API that goes to the, uh, goes to the other system that needs name and address information. So the way that you can solve this name and address problem is you decide, you choose one system that's gonna be your source for name and address. So it's your CRM, right? That's, that's the place where you deal with name and address information. You enter it in there, it goes into the data warehouse and now you can have that pushed out to the other systems. Uh, so there's less integration. You don't need to have each system talk with each system. You can just have everybody talk to one system just talk to the data warehouse. So data warehousing is great for those um, 
those two examples. One is reporting where you have all the information on one place, you can report on it more uh, readily. And the other is that you can uh, have it be this sort of single version of the truth. You enter information into one system and then you can have it propagate throughout the other systems, okay? Any questions on data warehousing? Hi, Stephen, this is Doug. Uh, I do have uh, a question here and it is, uh, what's the difference between a data warehouse and a database? Great, so that's a great question. And uh, you know, it sounds like semantics, right? Data warehouse, maybe it's just a bigger database or something like that. The database is designed for transactions. It's a, a place designed to have a lot of people connect to and it to post transactions into to tables. And that's helpful um, for lots of different use cases. But when it comes to reporting, you want fast reporting and a data warehouse is designed for fast reporting. Uh, it's designed to analyze the, the, the data. You can have more data in there, larger data sets, longer uh, data histories in a data warehouse. And so it enables you to, uh, to be able to report more easily and work with larger sets of, of data more easily. So this reminds me of uh, you know time when I was uh, just getting started. I worked in this multifamily office. Um, so it's a, a sizable multifamily office and we use the portfolio accounting system, but they also had a, uh, an accounting firm, they had a law practice, and their clients tended to be very wealthy families. So complicated you know, wealth pictures. We were doing all their performance reporting in Excel. We would take information out of the portfolio accounting system, put it into Excel. We would take information out of the tax system, put it into Excel. Take information from a number of different systems, we put it into Excel. Excel. That's how we did reporting, right? So um, Excel is great in a way in that it's kind of this blank slate, amorphous thing. You can put all the data in there, but it was very slow and cumbersome. So you do one report at a time, right? We got smarter. Then we moved into a database, just like, you know, we just talked about a database can work somewhat like this. So we use a SQL database and we use a thing called Crystal Reports. So we loaded the information in and now we could kind of do some easier reporting. But the challenge was the portfolio managers would come back to us and say, hey, um, you know, this is really cool, but now can we see it over a greater date range? Can we see more information from more places? And the database, you could kind of accomplish that, but it wasn't the best tool for the job. Nowadays, data warehouse, is that is, that is the tool. And there's some great ones out there. We use InvestFile. We think it's an awesome system. Uh, other examples of data warehouses are Snowflake, you probably heard of. They had an IPO not too long ago. Amazon Redshift, uh, Microsoft uh, has one as well. Uh, there's a number of that ones out there and you can just, you know, you can um, basically rent them by the hour. Uh, so <clears throat> data warehouse, and we think for, particularly for investment advisors, investment managers is a, um, a, a really important technology, not only to help with simplifying, which is a general theme here, but um, also to be able to help with reporting and uh, for a number of a number of reasons. Uh, one other thing I'll point out about um, these integrations, and uh, we're talking about uh, simplifying Metcalf's law. Um, Metcalf's law, uh, for those who don't know, is it's a sort of general notion of connections and how many integrations uh, there there are as you add more endpoints, right? So if you think you have two systems, you need to integrate with one in, one another. That's one integration, right? Because it, you don't have to integrate the one system to itself. So you have three systems, you have six integrations, you have nine systems, there's 36. One day I was doing some consulting work for a pretty large asset manager over in Boston and they had 160 systems. And you know they had the funds to be able to uh, do, the, do these kinds of integrations. You know, if they're doing true integration, I mean, they have 12,720 uh, connections that they need to make in order to move information around. So when I tell you keeping things simple, uh, the less systems that you can have, the simpler the integration, um, the, the more uh, efficient your operation will be. Uh, Metcalf's law totally applies to how you, um, you know, how your work with your systems. 
If you use a data warehouse, you just have one system that you can connect all your other systems to. So if you have seven systems, you have seven connections that you have to make, right? Rather than 21. So sim simple, good, complex, bad, try to keep things as simple as you, as you can when it comes to operations. Okay. Another area I wanna point out that we're seeing a lot of use cases and we actually spend a lot of time here ourselves is in robotic process automation. This is a relatively new technology. It's been around since, um, you know, within the past 10 years, it's gotten more popular. Um, robotic process automation is the sort of scripting tool that enables you to have a bot do work across multiple systems. So for example, we have a number of different uh, family offices that have large investments in private equity. The frustrating part about working with private equity, it's, it's not like uh, data that you get uh, that comes down in a data feed from a bank or custodian. You get a PDF statement in an email from one of these uh, private equity managers, or they uh, send you an email and it has a link and you have to go to their website to go get a statement or get a capital call or a distribution, whatever the notification could be, right? We have a bot that goes and just waits and listens for these emails. When it finds one of these emails, it opens up the attachment, it'll read into the attachment, figure out who it's for, what manager is it associated with, what entity it's associated with, grab that information out of there, say it's a capital call, they know, how much money they need to wire to the manager on what date, in what currency, for what entity. So, you know, the bot does all this. The robotic process automation enables you to have automation that spans across different systems. So that, that's the real beauty of it. Usually with automation, the automation is available for one system. So there's some scripting language, say with your portfolio accounting system, right? Or there's some, API and you can integrate and have it kind of communicate with another system. But, um, but it's kind of one, it's very one-to-one -one and a little clunky. Robotic process automation enables you to uh, do automation across different platforms and uh, configure workflows so that you can have bots be doing work that otherwise people would be doing. So in this day and age with fee compression and you know, trying to get the most out of your investment in FinTech or you know, what you spend in operations, Robotic process automation is a huge opportunity for uh, investment managers. And there's lots of different use cases for uh, robotic process automation. We use UiPath. Uh, automation Anywhere is another good one. And uh, Blue, Blue Prism also is another one. There's a few others out there. <clears throat> but um, this has taken off in outsourcing for uh, business process outsourcing for like the Accentures of the world. Um, but it hasn't had that much of an impact on investment management yet. We, we see a huge opportunity here uh, 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 for this particular kind of software, uh, this particular kind of uh, FinTech solution. Okay. So Stephen, uh, I have a question here. It's from Leora. Um, okay. Leora, do, do you wanna ask your question? Are you able to unmute yourself and ask your question or do you want me to ask it for you? Okay, so I'll go ahead. The question is, what do you do when you have a third party AI slash ML software, but uses a different platform, AWS? Is that wise? then you're responsible for AWS owning it too. So are you talking about, um, it, I think the question is, if we have the technology, but we're having it sit on top of AWS, does AWS then own the technology? Is, uh, is that what we're hearing? Uh, I, I, maybe I'm not understanding the question. Uh, the answer to that is yes, and our data. Yeah, so, okay, great. 
And when you develop something on AWS, you don't you own that technology. AWS is just providing uh, an, an instance or an environment for you to work in. Um, so now when you when you ramp down or you turn off the AWS environment, you obviously you need a new home for the, the coding to go to. But at the end of the day, you own that coding. So if you develop something um, and uh, I'm, Leora was mentioning AI or uh, ML machine learning, if you build something, you know, this is somewhat similar to RPA. If you build something, you own that tech. That's your, that's your IP, your intellectual property. It's just, you need, a, you need a new place to move it to if you're not going to use AWS. Okay. Does that answer, answer the question? I believe so. Thank you. All right. I have another question here. Sure. Uh, this is from uh, Aaron. And the question is, how do you set up the right quality assurance around spa tools without redoing the procedure to make sure it is producing correct outcome? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the spa tools are, but we do a lot of work in quality assurance. Um, we have a whole Six Sigma process around quality assurance for- oh, I'm sorry, Stephen, sorry to interrupt you. Not spa, uh, RPA tools. Okay, okay. so. Uh, yeah, so there's a number of points where you can put in quality assurance uh, stopping points or checkpoints and have a bot check itself before it moves to the next step, all right? So you can have some basic reconciliation that you add to the workflow. So that, that can be the stopping point, right? So you don't necessarily have the bot go all the way from open a, uh, an email, open the statement, read the information, put it, and then just immediately push it right into say the accounting system. You have it go into a staging area. You have somebody looking in the staging area, or you can have it go into the accounting system to the extent there's a staging area in the accounting system. And then somebody can sign off and, uh, and release it. But the other thing that you can do is you can build in uh, to the process itself, reconciliation uh, tool. So, you have it match up data that maybe you have from one place with an independent source. And when there's a break in that data, the, the bot stops. So there's a number of different ways that you can go about uh, putting that in, putting that QC check into your uh, RPA process so that the bot doesn't just go off in and uh, just start producing chocolates uh, at the factory that, you know, you can't handle the volume coming through. You can't deal with, right? So you need, um, there's lots of ways that you can insert that uh, QC into the workflow uh, so you catch yourself and uh, a mistake doesn't get out there. Good? Good, thank you. All right. Um, uh, so the next, next slide I have here is how to get the most from your FinTech investment. You know, I think a lot of people aren't gonna be too happy with this first, my first notion on this. Um, you talk, remember the, the overarching theme here is simplicity, right? Uh, the way that you get the most out of your investment, particularly from software, and software is the greatest area around FinTech for, for, for investment managers, is you conform your business to the software. So you don't have the software be customized for your business. The reality is, our firms, they're, we're not all that different, right? And if you are using a piece of software and there's 5,000 other firms using that same system, they, they've got to kind of figure it out how generally things work, right? The work is fairly, mono, uh, fairly homogenous. So if you can conform yourself to the software and leverage the software as it's, as it's set up, that's, you're going to get the greatest ROI. You, you just are, right? Um, you know, we're, one area where we see lots of um, uh, customization is around billing. Everybody wants, uh, everybody has some different kind of way to skin the cat when it comes to billing. Generally, portfolio accounting systems bill on assets under management. And maybe it's tiered or maybe it's flat fee or uh, you know, a flat basis points on assets under management. Um, 
but as soon as, you know, and, and you know, a, a client will say, hey, well, listen, I put in a whole bunch of money this month. Uh, I don't want you to charge me on that because I, I just put it in. It's the last day of the month. And, you know, uh, your system's just going to be bill me for it. Um, you, we, we have firms that that's, they just bill for whatever's there, you know, you wait a day and put it in the next month, right? Uh, that's the, you know, that's may not be great. It may not feel like great customer service, uh, but that is, you know, some don't change and that's the way it is. And that's really efficient, right? Um, the other is you can say, well, okay, well this month I'll, I'll instead of charging you 50 basis points, I'll charge you 40 basis points. There you're at least, you're, you know, trying to be, um, you know, uh, flexible with your client, but you're not changing the structure in the way that you bill. Once you start changing the structure in the way that you bill, you know, ignore this concentrated position, um, bill for a different rate for these assets, for fixed income versus equities. Uh, you, you start to get into all these permutations. There's a lot of systems that just don't handle those. And for you to come up with a system to handle those is a lot of work. Not only that, it adds complexity, right? So each one of these is another exception. And when you have another exception, it's another place to go wrong. And look, let's face it, operations, this is like the plumbing of investment management. This is not the glamour side of the business. This is not the, you know, there's nothing sexy about operations, right? It's moving data around, getting it into formats so that it ends up on, on a report. Um, so you want to try to minimize and turn your operation into this well-oiled machine as much as possible. The more instances of uh, variability you add to that operation, the greater the likelihood of uh, error there is, right? So the, you know, the, most way, the, the best way to get the most from your FinTech investment is really try to conform to uh, the software. Use the software as it was intended. Don't try to be, um, uh, you know, don't try to be too crazy around what you're, what you're doing with that, uh, that software. Don't try to build lots of automate or uh, build lots of customizations to it, whether they, if they're in the software, in their software is, is better, but try not to build customizations to it. If you build customizations out of it, it's worse, right? You end up with this Franken system of, you know, one's uh, your main system and then a bunch of SQL databases and things off, off to the side trying to solve your needs. It just adds the complexity and it will cost more and uh, the likelihood of error just goes up. Um, when you look at buying a new system, new systems, Frequently, you know, they just evolve. People, systems evolve and they get smarter and there's more functionality in them. To the extent they have more functionality, try to reduce the systems that you have. And again, this goes back to simplicity. It, is there a way that you can leverage that additional functionality, right? So I keep talking about portfolio accounting systems because those are the systems that are, uh, you know, the most widely used, every, every um, operation has them. And some of them are very pure, very focused around portfolio accounting. Newer systems come with a CRM. Do you need a separate CRM from, uh, uh, or can you get rid of your CRM? Try to simplify, try to simplify. If, it's, um, if you can use the portfolio accounting system also as your CRM, it's good enough. Then you, know, you don't need to integrate with another system. It's one less places to check for problems. Uh, it's less sources to have to worry about having the information in there correctly. A whole nine yards. So I try to reduce systems, um, you know, when you go purchase uh, and when you add new, uh, add new systems to your uh, operation. Excuse me, Stephen. Yes. Um, going back to customization and configuration, a question was asked, can you expand on the terms customization versus configuration? Sure. Configuration is a system does a certain does a certain thing, and you um, are adjusting settings that are already built into that system to get it to do what you want, right? It already does it, right? It's it's uh, it's already baked in there. It's just more of setting it up so that it works the way you want it to, given the parameters or the uh, the settings that you can affect change on in that system. Um, and customization is getting the system to do something new. So it could be some custom report. It could be 
calculate some different calculation on assets. Uh, it could be, um, you know, it, it's doing something that out of the box it doesn't do and you can't just, you know, adjust some settings and it'll just do it. So that's the difference between customization and uh, configuration. Thank you. Good. All right. Um, another point around your systems um, and how to get the most from your fintech investment, you, you really want to um, leverage all that new system has to offer. What I find that happens frequently is somebody buys a system and there's the main thing that they buy it for. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other things that it does, but you really bought it for this main thing. Um, you go through this uh, implementation. We'll talk a little bit more about implementations later. You go through this implementation, it's very painful. You forget all, you're just happy to be done with it and, and using it to some degree. Um, there's actually a whole bunch of functionality that's sitting there and you're not using. Now, sometimes uh, the, the main functionality that you bought it for was, you know, th there's enough ROI in that functionality and you're going to be happy with that. But frequently there's opportunities for you to leverage more in that system. I recommend you go, go back to the website. Just, you don't even, you didn't need to call a salesperson or anything. You just go to that, that uh, software vendor's website and go remind yourself all that's in there. Because, you know, these simply, there's a lot in these systems and there's an opportunity for you to leverage more of what you have out of an existing system than you going out and buying a new one, all right? So um, the other thing you know, I mentioned operations is just the plumbing of the business. The, you know, the challenge with operations is, even though it's the plumbing of the business, the people that are making frequently making decisions around systems and what gets purchased are not the ones running the plumbing, right? So it's the portfolio manager, chief investment officer, front, front, uh, front office people that are, are making a lot of these decisions, right? So to the extent you can keep things simple for yourself, it'll be better. To the extent you can show that those front office people that, hey, I don't need, you don't need to go buy a new system. You can get it out of what you've got and don't, don't need to spend money. You'll look great. Uh, and it's just another way to get more from, from your existing investment. You know, there's a lot that goes on in these systems. It's very easy to forget that, believe it or not, under, underneath what you've already bought, with a little bit of work, you can get value. You can squeeze value out of your, uh, your, your spending, your current spending. You don't need to spend a dime more. This gets me to, it reminds me of a client that we had. Uh, this was kind of a while ago, but this was a, a, a firm I met. I was doing consulting at the time and there was a, um, you know, a small manager over in Beverly Hills that I went to visit. Uh, so I get to his office and he's managing a couple hundred million dollars and I go in there and, and it's literally just him. It's him and his laptop. He's got maybe 75, 100 families that he's working with. He has his accounting system on the laptop. He has his Bloomberg on the laptop. He has the, just the core things that he needs. And he was in a suite. He didn't have an assistant. It's just this one guy managing a, a lot of money. And uh, think about how efficient that is, right? I mean, he didn't need that much. It's, I mean, that's beautiful design. The, the, the simpler can be the better. Uh, so he didn't need, he didn't need a whole bunch of um, uh, customizations. It was very simple. It's just, you know, charging basis points on, on assets under management. I'm sure there were no exceptions to the way he built. His performance reporting was straight, up, was straight out of the, uh, the software itself. No customization there. <clears throat> He's a great example of somebody just conforming their business to the software. And, you know, a one man shop managing $200 million, like, okay, fine. He's not capital group or something like that. But uh, the guy's doing really well for himself with minimal headache, right? Um, so the simpler you can make things, the better it will be for you, um, uh, for you managing your operation. All right. Uh, Doug, just stop me if there's, if you have any, if there's any other questions about you know, getting the most out of the, your uh, FinTech spend. Thank you, will do. Um, okay, so some pitfalls I want you to avoid when uh, implementing new systems. Generally the firms, you know, I think our clients and a lot of people on this on the call here, they're working in firms that have maybe five to 25 or 50 people in them, you know, not huge firms, right? 
Um, when you're implementing systems that involve multiple users, the most important thing is adoption. If you, if you buy something and you only have a couple people that are gonna use it, um, <clears throat> you know, you, your adoption isn't, it's not as big of a problem. It's just the two of you, right? It's just two of you in operations. If, it, if you are uh, bought some system and it's gonna cut across departments or the way the, the, way that, uh, that the system works and the way that your firm is gonna get benefit out of that system is by having lots of people use it, it's, it's essential you get adoption, right? Um, everybody's heard the story about, um, it's, this isn't just investment advisors in any industry, but there's some business, they go through some change, maybe they're using a new system, what have you. And then there's this one old guy that, you know, he's doing things his way, he's still printing things off and it goes into a three ring binder and uh, meets with his clients that way, right? And um, like he hasn't bought into why the adoption's good or how the adopt how to make the adoption uh, easy, right? So just remember simplicity. If it's a complex adoption and he's got to use multiple systems, he's not going to use it, right? He's set in his ways already. So you need to make that adoption as easy as possible for him. Um, uh, but that is a, a huge thing that a lot of people miss, a huge point that a lot of people miss when uh, implementing a new system is making sure that adoption happens. At the end of the day, that's what all the ROI is based upon. Part of getting to that adoption is having the political will to let people know that this is the system that we're gonna use, right? So it, it, you're not buying the, the new system because you love the old system so much. The old system was old and you know there are reasons that you wanted to be on the new system. Well, I frequently find that the people at the top, the ones that are making decisions, uh, we find this in organizations where there's a CEO, but then there is like the money maker, right? There is the one rep that brings in all the money, the lion's share of the money for the firm. And things get hung up because that one guy is effectively making decisions for everybody else in the firm, no matter how inefficient they are. The CEO needs the political will to say, this is the new system, this is the, this is the way, I mean, it's for the greater good, right? And get that person engaged and on board. A political will is very important um, with uh, accomplishing this. Um, and you know, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. But you know, the, lastly, the, the best way to get political will is you burn the boats. You tell everybody, communicate with everybody that, hey, that old system is going off this day. You know, it, it doesn't bring us joy anymore. This is the day we're going to say our goodbyes. We'll have some champagne, whatever, but it's gone, right? You literally need to burn the boats sometimes. Um, this happens probably more in firms that have maybe 15 or 20 or more people where, you know, a lot of people are using them, but you got to know that the end of life is coming. And um, there's good reasons why you should be off that system and you, you, you need to burn the boats. And that's, that's how you get everybody on. The worst, a real challenge is when you have your spanning systems. You have, you're doing some things the old way, printing paper, you're doing some things by sending them out, by, uh, sending out PDFs via email, and then you have a client portal. I mean, you're creating lots of places where things can go, uh, go wrong in, in the process there. Steven, I do have a question for you. Sure. And the question is, how do you manage change in requirements once the impl implementation started? So the way that you manage change your requirements once the implementation is started is communication. You have to communicate. Um, we, I, I think frequently you have, um, uh, with, with smaller groups, there's this sort of decentralized communication, right? You need more people understanding what the requirements are, and you want more people. Uh, you you can't you can't micromanage at, at a small level. Once once things have started and and um, and you've gotten going on the project, and you need to change. Um, first of all, you try to avoid that change in the first place, right? Um, you really want to nail down your requirements up front. 
if it's a critical change, somehow you missed it. It's, uh, you know, now's the most, you know, generally, generally the, the reason why you make the change is because, hey, we're already in there. It's like building a house or we already tore down the wall. So now um, it makes sense for us to add that additional wall now rather than after we, you know, finish this wall. Um, that's, just, uh, that's just what it is. And this is why implementations become painful. Um, you know, no communicating, you can do all the great communicating you want around it, but it's still gonna be you know, painful and there's gonna be knock on effects from that, right? So you try to minimize it as best you can. Um, it, to the extent that they, they happen, you communicate with everybody about it, but that's, um, you know, that's sort of the nature of the beast when you're, when you're doing these implementations. Um, the other thing is, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more in, in a bit here, but when you're managing uh, a project and there are, and it's, you know, an involved project, five people or greater, you know, complicated system, you really need some system of being able to manage that project. You don't want to do it in Excel and just have sort of scrum meetings every now and then. Um, you, you need a means to be able to communicate out to people and you need a way to see what's happening with that project real time. So we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, and maybe hopefully that'll add some more color to, or you know, give a little bit more color to this person's question. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> um, so we're talking about, you know, burning the boats. I have this example. There was this multifamily office, excuse me. There was this multifamily office who we happen to still work with. I won't name names. I, I'm not even going to put the geography out there, but you know, we met them eons ago and we've been working with them, you know, 10 plus years. Hopefully that doesn't narrow it down too much. But anyway, the, um, the reason that they came to us is because they wanted this customized reporting thing, right? Now, back 10 plus years ago, we weren't, we weren't doing that much with, uh, you know, data warehousing and those kinds of things. But we took a look at their reporting and we're helping them out with their operations. And, um, you know, they had the money to, uh, uh, you know, to spend on solving this problem. And they, they are a prime example of lack of political will, right? Now, the challenge is uh, they, their clients are all, you know, it's a multifamily office. So each one of their clients is a, pretty much a family office in and of itself. And family offices, for those of you that don't know, they're not profit-seeking entities. A family office happens to be a, a wealthy enough person or family that is almost a mini institution unto themselves, right? They have a couple hundred million dollars of net worth. Um, they can afford to have their own in private investment advisor. They can afford to have their own, you know, investment operation, little investment operation team. So they're not profit-seeking entities. And so there's some, there's some additional uh, dynamics at play with a, um, with a multifamily office that aren't at play with other sort of profit-seeking you know, investment advisors. But anyway, the, you know, these clients are used to their customization and everybody pretty much had customization. Uh, so each one of those clients, each one of those families was getting customizations. Now we looked at their reporting and we found that, you know, yeah, even though there was, they're doing this in Excel and they looked, uh, a lot of them looked different, but you know, some of them, there was like a column over here and a, instead of the column being over there. I mean, not, not like crazy customization. So we should be able to get this onto, um, you know, one way of doing things. It'll be a lot more efficient. You won't have to, you know, do all the quality control with the partners, the whole, you know, it would be a huge time saver. Um, they're still doing things on Excel. And the, the reason is because of lack of political will. Um, it, there's no other good reason for it. Uh, you uh, sometimes, even clients, like nobody wants things to change, but people understand when change needs to happen. Um, you know, I, I, I like to go out to eat. I have a friend that runs a restaurant. You know, he doesn't seat me on time right away. Sometimes they're busy. There's somebody else sitting there. What are you going to do? I mean, you're going to be mad at them. You know, uh, same thing with this. Uh, you know, you run a, a business. It needs to make money. Um, you know, you've got 20 people helping you out with reporting. I mean, that's just hundreds of thousands of dollars just on somebody doing very admin type stuff. Uh, you know, the, the entity needs to be able to exist. And I think the clients would under understand that if they, you know, 
if it was explained to him. Now, obviously, there's always exceptions. Someone's going to complain and you know not be happy, but more than likely, they're not going to leave if they like you, right? This isn't the one and only thing. So political will plays a very big role in this whole uh, you know, notion of implementing systems and how ultimately that, uh, that system works. All right, um, so legacy versus new system. I'm, I'm a fan of legacy systems. <laughs> I, I mean, remember, it goes back to things being simple. If you don't need that, uh, if that system does everything for you, if, you if, and if it's true legacy, it's probably something you bought eons ago. You might not, um, there was a, a date, I don't remember when, call it the early 2000s, where everything switched from software that you you sort of paid this big upfront and then maybe you paid 20% of the value every year, sort of maintenance. Everything switched to the, to the uh, subscription economy where everything's term now. So now you paid a little bit more every year. It was kind of a lot more, but you paid more every year, but you got the, um, uh, you know, it was always going to work with the latest systems. They just switched it to term, uh, term licensing. And so the upfront cost was less. You know, legacy systems, a lot of people put money into those legacy systems. I mean, the, the calculation for IRR has not changed, right? Uh, so that's still the, the same. Um, if you have, if your reporting needs aren't uh, elaborate, if you, the system is giving you what you need, I would be loath to move, right? It just works. Why, why, you know, why make life more complicated? Why make life more difficult? Now, uh, so legacy doesn't always equal bad. Um, so it could be huge ROI. You're saving tons of money. Like I would milk that until the cows come home. You know, you want to be on that train. Now there's some, there's valid reasons for moving off of legacy systems. One is, you know, you, the system, um, you know, what worked back then doesn't, doesn't work now. Like the, you know, the, the way that you trade evolves, right. And the old system just doesn't have a way to trade that, uh, you, you just can't operate that way anymore. Um, so life is dramatically better functionally, right? It, it does things that uh, newer systems do a whole bunch of things that old systems just couldn't do. Uh, the way they're built and all, it, they just, it's very easy. You just log in and uh, you can uh, get all the functionality that you need, right? But um, you, it needs to be dramatically better if it's going to be pretty much like for life. Uh, the other reason to move off is, is uh, we'll talk about this some more in a bit, is basically maybe, maybe it's a small co company that you bought the software from and they're sunsetting it. They're not going to support it anymore. I mean, at that point, you just got to move, right? They're not, you, you're not going to be able to, um, if, if something happens, there's a lot of business risk. You can't stay on that system anymore, right? Um, uh, if it's a big company and, and it's on it, like Advent Access is a, is a great example. That system's been out there forever. I cut my teeth on Advent Access. Um, I, I, if I know that they're not setting and sunsetting it, I'd keep on, keep on with, with Advent Access, particularly if I, I paid the, uh, what do you call it? Eons ago, you know, and it just doesn't cost me that much money. If I paid the, the, what's called perpetual license uh, a long time ago. So you try to try to milk the most out of those systems, but you know, the reality is, uh, there are, um, you know, you have competitors out there, competitors move on to newer systems, their clients get a digital experience. And if you're doing everything in paper, um, you know, there, there could be a sort of strategic reason why you need to move on to, you know, sort of get your, get your business into the 21st century. You need a client website, have a more digital experience. You know, your old clients today, they're going to pass that wealth down into younger people. They're not going to want to see something on paper at all, ever. Right. They're going to want it on their phone and they're going to want it over the web, you know, worst case over the web, but more than likely on their phone. So, you know, there's valid reasons to move, uh, move to um, newer systems and particularly cloud based. So if, if you are going to buy a new system, do not buy anything that you install, uh, install on a local server. For small and medium sized firms, there should be no reason why you're going on to anything that is installed locally at all. Um, you buy a server, you're, you're never just buying a server, you're buying a server, you're buying the AC to cool the server, the power, the uninterruptible power to keep the server up and going and if the power goes out. Uh, you're buying you know, backups and you're buying outsourced IT guy to come in there and patch the server. There's like a gazillion things that go into having a server. And um, you know, I've done it. I, I've had to deal with all those things. Talk about like 
just mental mind share. You, you just want the software. The server has to come with it. I mean, so it's just, a, it's just not worth it in this day and age. There should be no small, medium sized investment manager that's uh, using, you know, going to Dell and buying servers these days. All right. And if you, if you are having a problem in kicking that habit, you know, see me after class. I will, I will help you out with that one. All right. Okay. So build versus buy is sort of similar to what we were just talking about. You really want to avoid building things all together, right? Um, this may be painful to hear, but you're not that special. Like most investment advisors, they look generally the same, right? And I'm telling you, if you can conform yourself to the software, you're going to have a better ROI for your spend in software. Now, you know, there might be reasons, strategic reasons why there is nothing out there that you can get off the shelf from some other tech vendor, right? If there's some strategic, overarching strategic reason, okay, I get it. Look, I, I like building things myself. We built, um, you know, that whole RPA process we built. There's a, a, a ton of different things that we build for clients all the time. It's interesting. It's fun. And if you get somebody that's good in your operation, you know, they're going to want to do these kinds of projects, right? Um, they, will, they will build that Franken system for you. you. You really don't want that. You want the simplest setup uh, that you can have. So when you build things, you run into problems um, that you probably don't think about. <clears throat> um, frequently, if you have no experience in building something for yourself, like building software or tech for yourself, you're apt to find a friend or somebody that knows somebody that built something for them. And uh, oftentimes this is the case that they knew a small firm, a guy that, or a couple guys that got together and they, could build, they built something great for them. Uh, and maybe they could build it for you. Working with small groups of guys like that is, is hazardous if you just don't have experience in building software. It's, it's hazardous. Um, uh, there's a number of reasons why. One, frequently they're, they're going to architect a solution that isn't appropriate for what you need. You might find your, your friend used them. They got a great result. They worked in a total different industry, different use case, what have you. That's fine, well, and good for them. For you, you have a different use case. They might not get how uh, you know, these calculations work that you need, right? We, we have a, a, a client over in Cyprus right now, some Russian guys that over in Cyprus, they have you know, a crazy margin calculation that they're doing with forwards and, and stuff. You know, there's not, that's not something that you're gonna find a, um, a business analyst that knows readily, right? They have to know something about the industry uh, and there's a lot of other things that go into that in terms of being able to architect a solution for them. So you're going to you're going to be frustrated just kind of helping them come up with a solution. You can't just, you know, you, you probably don't make specs uh, that frequently. Um, so, but aside from that, if you absolutely have to use somebody, if this is like, you know, um, strategically important for you or super, you know, there's nothing out there, you can't buy it. Um, use something that's widely available, use mature tech. So when I say, when I'm talking about those things, widely available is something like SQL, SQL, right? Um, and mature tech, it, you want generally most things that you need to build, it's gonna be SQL on AWS. It's that simple, SQL on AWS. Everybody knows that if you're a developer, you know AWS, uh, it's Amazon Web Services. It's, uh, uh, you know, you're not buying servers. You can just rent it by the hour. If the whole project goes bust, you can just stop paying for Amazon. You know, the moment you're, uh, the moment it goes kaput. Um, and also, it's in an environment that it's it's high availability. You know, they know that server's down before you know it's down. Okay, so you go with Amazon Web Services. It's cheap. It's you know less than hundred bucks a month to start. And then you get somebody that knows SQL. Everybody knows SQL, right? If you're talking about a developer, loads of people know SQL. So. Um, that's the kind of tech that you're looking for. Something like that. You've heard those, you've heard those names before. Widely used, mature, been out there. If you get the guy that wants to build things on Linux, nobody else uses Linux in this industry or very you know, few people, large firms use Linux. I mean, it sounds all cool and racy, but um, you're just gonna be harder pressed to find somebody. Now, Linux is fairly widely available, but um, uh, SQL, you know, probably 95% of the things that you want to build can be built on .NET SQL and AWS. That's it. Okay. Um, so my cautionary tale around this is 
um, we worked with a, a pretty sizable firm over in Ohio and, and the firm, you know, they were managing 10 plus billion dollars in assets, tens of thousands of accounts, wealth manager. Um, they were on a system that, you know, uh, the proverbial three guys built, right? And the firm got wildly successful. Uh, it was a homegrown portfolio accounting system. Now that system did really well. And people liked it. Like they didn't, they didn't want to leave that system. What happened was <clears throat> one of the guys got a, uh, another job somewhere else, was making some uh, you know, more money, what have you. The other guy had kids, had a you know, life-changing experience or whatever, just stopped um, you know, working for the firm. And the last guy was left there to support the system that a hundred and some odd people are using on a daily basis, right? No, let alone you know, reporting and billing and everything else. You know, just like talk about huge business risk, right? And he had gotten to the point where he didn't want to do it anymore. Like literally, like he didn't want to service him anymore. I mean, like you can't fault the guy, but the the, the reality is, um, you know, he built a great system, but there's just, you know, um, you know, there was no one really, it, it wasn't a business building. It, I mean, Larry Ellison said, if, you, if you're if you going to have software built for you, obviously he's talking about the biggest firms in the world. If you're going to have software built for you, you just go buy, you, you have the biggest software company in the world build it for you. That's the way you mitigate the risk, right? There's enough people there they can uh, to, um, uh, to do the coding, you know, if somebody quits, leaves, gets married, has a change of heart, whatever, just isn't there anymore. There's, you know, there's a thousand other developers that can fill his shoes. So um, try not to build at all. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm a fan myself. I, I like building cool, cool things, We're build, developing automation. It's part of what we do at Impaxis. Um, uh, try to leverage what's in the tech already. Um, if you have to build something, build it using stuff that everybody knows. Okay, um, and so you'll you'll be well served by by going that route. Okay, um, uh, next slide. We're talking about uh, how to make migration easier. Uh, so when you're dealing with fintech and you're and you're going to be setting up some new system, there's what's called a migration. Right, a migration is you're taking the data off the old system and you're going to bring it into the new system. Or even if it's brand new system, you're migrating the system, you're you're setting the system up, you're configuring it, and now you got to get new users to use it or load in data, whatever it is. Um, so the best that you can hope for here is to make it easier. It is never easy to do a migration. Okay, so you got to set your bar lower. It, it's going it, assume it's going to be the most painful thing ever, and if it's not then, hey, that's great, happy days. So, um, but it's, it's, it's gonna be difficult. There's, systems are complicated. There's a lot involved, uh, a lot of data that gets into them. There's a lot, of fun, a lot of just processes that are happening behind the scenes, under the hood. We don't even need to understand it, but know that uh, they're under the hood. They, they, they are actually complicated little engines, right? And so, it's not so easy as, well, hey, I got it into, I got the data in this format in Excel. Why don't you just load into that system over there and it should come out fine. It doesn't work that simple. So your best bet is you plan early uh, for these system migrations, okay? Plan early. When you plan early, you can think about things that are gonna go wrong, right? Donald Rumsfeld talks about, you know, knowing there are known knowns and then there are known unknowns. Right, those kinds of things. And the, and the things that get you are the unknown unknowns. There's a whole bunch of complicated things that are happening behind the scenes in these systems. And you, at, what you can control are the known knowns and the known unknowns. And you wanna control for those as much as possible. So think about what's gonna be involved, work with your, um, the service provider or the data, uh, or the, the software company that you're gonna be doing this migration with, identify as much of um, you know, the body of work that there is so that you can get a jump on it. Ask what, what you can do to organize that data in advance. You, I mean, you, ideally you want to wrap the data up in a bow and give it to them exactly how they need it, right? The de I mean, the devil is in the data. The, the details are just millions and millions and millions of places where you can go wrong in the data. So generally problems with migrations happen around data. So the more you can prep and have that data ready in a format that that new system needs uh, it to be in, the, the better off you'll be and the, the easier your, uh, your migration will be. The other thing I would say is, and you can do this today, 
check your contract dates. You know, this doesn't really apply if you're just moving on to one system and you're getting rid of another system, sort of a one to one thing. But if it's a foundational system and then you you have a bunch of other systems that are sort of tied to it, you're you're going to buy one system and you can scrap these three. You want to get your contract dates to be aligned. Right. What do I mean by that is that frequently you buy the one system and then you realize you need this other one and then you realize you need the third. Right. So now your contract dates are all kind of all over the place. So when it comes time to leave that system, all right, you're focused on the contract date for the main system, but you have these other two dates out there. And a lot of firms just like, we're like, well, I, I mean, um, it's the cost of doing business or whatever, but you know, you, you might be spending nine months or, or so of, of, of spend on a contract that you're getting absolutely zero out of. If you can plan and you know, like, all right, I don't know if it's this year, but maybe it's next year. And if you have a lot of time, you should just do this anyway. You know, there are people incentivized in the renewals department of software companies that are all there just to get you to renew. So if you know you're going to renew, you're on some contract that automatically renews. Um, um, or if you're, uh, you know, you're going to renew anyway, and they're generally going to call you up. That's your time to negotiate and try to get that, get that, those dates aligned, right? So you're not going to, you're not going to be able to ask for a shorter date uh, and say, hey, I want this to, you know, come here. But you can say, look, I want um, for this next contract term, I want it to go like a year and three months, and then auto renew every year for, you know, from then forward, or a year and six months, and that's like a gift to them, right? They got more time with you. Um, but if you don't, you'll end up spending money. It's just, it's just wasted, right? And so if you know that's the way the system works, you can get those uh, uh, contract dates to be aligned and uh, you'll save money in the future. I don't know if you'll, you'll get a bonus from it from your bosses and they'll recognize it, but it's some money it might go to a, a, you know, a nice holiday party or something like that. All right. Um, Go on to our next slide. Any any questions there, Doug? Good. Yeah, we're doing we're doing well. Thank you. No, this right. is terrific. All right. So, um, some project management tips for you. You end up, frequently end up doing projects in in operations. Um, so with small firms, you really want to focus on communication. We touched upon this before. When there's just a handful of people. If you can communicate specifically what the project's going to be, like really everybody knows what, you know, how this project is going to evolve, how it needs to be set up. You're a small team of three people or so. Um, they know precisely what, what needs to be done. Then you don't need so much management, right? You can just manage the project in Excel. It's just the three of you. Everybody knows if, if um, they're not sure, they know the goal of the project and they can, uh, you know, they can continue on. They don't need to wait for you, that you don't need to micromanage them and, and share every bit of detail, right? So communication is really important for small projects. Uh, communication is really important for all projects, but particularly for small projects, it's just because it, it'll reduce the amount of management overhead that you need to apply to getting your project off the ground. Now, if you start to get more into more complicated projects, I'm talking five people or more, <clears throat> you, you just need to get software. Uh, it, it's just, um, there's lots of project management software out there. Um, uh, you, you need to manage it. Um, there's too many things that are happening and there's too many moving parts for you to try to just do it in Excel. Not only that, communication becomes tougher when you have five plus people, right? And it's even tougher if it's COVID and everybody's working from home and what have you. So. Um, frequently people are distributed, they're not in the same office. So project management software will help you with that. And um, it'll also help you with focusing on what are the, of the million some odd tasks we need to do to get this thing off the ground. What are the ones that we need to focus on today so that we are hitting our deadlines and you know, when, we're, when we're expecting to deliver things or what we're hitting our milestones, okay? Um, so, do, you, you just got to invest in the software. Uh, this stand, it's standalone. It doesn't, need to, it doesn't need to be integrated with anything else. You can just use it straight away. So, you know, for us, you know, as we were growing, we did lots of projects. Um, you know, Impaxis now has about 65 people. 
we're based here in LA. We have an office in London. Our operation centers in India. Uh, so really, where everything happens, quite frankly, is in India. So we use project management software for a number of things. We have a huge project that we're, we're doing right now. And so we, we're just living on this thing. But even for smaller internal projects, um, uh, our uh, SSAE 18 audit, uh, preparing for that, our um, ISO 27001 uh, certification. You know, there are lots of, of pieces to be able, that you need to have done in a certain sequence with dependencies, a whole nine yards. Uh, that you need to um, to manage, and the other thing is, you know, they're they're over in India, right? I can't I can't watch them, right? I can't see them, um, even if they were in the office. If you see somebody, you know, uh, you know, on their laptop keying away, that doesn't mean they're being effective for you, right? So you need to know what you've assigned to them, how about how long that's going to take, so you know what your labor utilization is, right? You don't want um, when you add more people, labor utilization goes down generally. So you want to make sure that you're on top of how you're managing those people. You know that there's 40 hours in a week and you know that you've already mapped out these number of tasks uh, are going to take a certain amount of time. You can assign those tasks. You can track their time. You know, you need to know um, what that labor utilization is. Otherwise, everybody's busy and, and nobody's going to come and tell you, hey, um, you know, I don't really have anything to do right now, so hook me up. You know, uh, there are some people that are there for the cause, and you know they, you know they will do that. Most of them won't, and and it's not for nefarious reasons. It's just that um, you know there's other busy things that they can do, and they'll you know they you didn't tell them to do anything, so they're not going to do anything, right? So you um, you want to know for yourself as the manager or the one that's in, in, responsible for that group that your team is, your labor is being effectively utilized. You don't want it out there where you've, you've staffed up for this big project and uh, you know what all the work is, but you haven't um, assigned the work to the team members or, or what have you, you know? So you, you, using project management software will, will really help with that. And we use it, uh, we use it every day. And I, you know, I, I don't know how we get by without it. So Steven, I, I have a number of questions for you. So. Um, we're approaching six o'clock, so you tell me at what point you don't want any more questions. <laughs> I, have, I have a list for you here. Um, so first one is, uh, in your opinion, what approach better fits these kind of system projects, waterfall or agile? So we use agile. Uh, I found that works really well. We've done waterfall before, but I find that um, using this sort of rapid prototyping and, and just you know, turning something around really quick to see what it looks like. And is it, you know, um, that just, that just suits me better. I know you can, you know, wa waterfall can work. And then there's a, there's a whole bunch of other ones uh, out there, but um, we follow an agile methodology. Okay. And is that the same for project management software choices? Yeah, it's, for for pretty much everything we do, we we really follow. We, I wouldn't say we're we've ever followed a strong waterfall methodology. We've kind of went through it a few years back. I'm forgetting which project it was on. You know, it's, but it's a bit more rigid structure of you know you're doing this before you do that before you do that. So um, we found that uh, agile just works better for us. But it sounds like you know people people get good results with either. And, and so that therefore, um, in the question, you know, is there a particular system that is good for project management? This is falling to agile again. Well, for uh, as far as systems go for project management, we've used a number of, we've used ACE project, which is really good. It's a web-based system. We use Microsoft project. That was, um, uh, that was locally in, installed. Um, you know, we got rid of that one quick. Uh, we, you know, I think we moved, I forget how many years we've been off of servers that we own ourselves, probably since like 2005 or 2006, somewhere around there. Uh, so we use monday.com right now, and that's working really well for us. We, we really like it, but there's a ton of ton of ones out there. Um, you know, Google it, there'll, there'll be a whole bunch that, that come up, but you know, monday.com seems to do really well for us. It's pretty easy to configure and, um, you know, we have a, a lot of users on it. So it's, it's working really well. Great. Okay. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> All right. So 
third party, we only have a couple more slides here, so it's, it's not too much longer. Third party um, ma vendor management tips. You know, these are sort of basic, some of these things are kind of uh, uh, basic. Um, this is, and this relates really to, to software. When, when you are using a system, I mean, you may be using, and this could be, it doesn't matter if you're the tiniest firm and you're, you're using salesforce.com, right? Some mega, mega software provider and you're a tiny firm. Um, you want to give feedback. That's the way that software evolves, okay? The squeaky wheel totally gets the grease. I worked at Advent Software. It was exactly that way over there. Now, obviously, at the end of the day, with software companies, you know, contract size is is the most effective thing. What? How much money are you putting with them? Um, so, as a small firm, that doesn't mean you're uh, you, you have no recourse because uh, they have lots of other firms that may be similar to you. Your goal should be to identify, you know, go to the go to the conference and find firms that look like you, and give feedback. But give feedback, you know, that is a sort of consortium. Um, if you don't give feedback, you're just gonna, um, you know, you're you're at their mercy, right? Now that being said, if it's mature software, a lot of firms that look like you are using it, you should be good. And remember, go back to I would conform to the software rather than trying to do anything crazy. But if you if you find that like um, there's some functionality that a certain segment of the user base uh, would really benefit from. The way that you, you get you got to vote that stuff up, right? Uh, so if it's some calculation around margin or some you know performance breakout or, or whatever, get a get a few more firms, and you'll see that it ends up on the roadmap a lot quicker. So communicating with your with your software um, uh, partners is important. The other thing is, uh, you know, they hear from other firms struggling with similar issues. You know, it might be validation. It might not be. Um, uh, if you're struggling with something with that on, on their system, knowing that others are struggling is nice validation, right? That it's not it's it's not working for them as well, and it's not working for you. It's not like you're you're doing something wrong. So communicating, having that communication with these important vendors and, and important software providers is really important. And then we mentioned this before: negotiate your uh, initial term to coincide with your main application to the extent um, you know you have one one thing and uh, uh, a whole bunch of other systems are going to feed off of it all right uh, this is our this is our last one so uh, lastly hiring fintech talent <clears throat> so in in investment operations your goal needs to be keeping turnover really low and having great people so I, i'd almost say that keeping turnover really low is on par with having great people so the reason is, this is, remember, it's investment operations, right? Generally, once uh, you, once your portfolio managers or the front office people, they've created their report and that's the look and feel, that's, it's going to stay that way for quite a long time. So your goal is to deliver on that consistently. And the best way to get to consistency is to stay, to having people stay with you. Now, uh, you know, someone typically staying with you in, in operations is somewhere between three, you know, I think it's a little bit longer now. It used to be like two to three years. Um, maybe it's maybe it's hovering around three years now, uh, maybe four years. You want to keep that low because if things aren't changing, then you are more likely doing a more, cons you're providing a more consistent result, right? So that should be your goal uh, is to try to keep turnover low. It takes a long time to hire somebody. Um, it's, if you're going to hire somebody fat, you're going to steal them from somebody else. Um, first of all, you're going to overpay for them. If they're, if they're any good, they're going to want to be doing a whole bunch of projects. They're not going to want to be doing the same thing over and over again, which is going to lend itself to turnover. So try to find somebody that's good and that's going to stay with you a long time and then invest in them. Okay. That's, that would be my suggestion. Uh, that's where we've got the best uh, results. Now, identifying who that is and what they look like is tough, right? Just because somebody can spell SQL, SQL, doesn't mean they know SQL, right? So you know, you need to test people. You, you, you need to test people. So there's testing on their subject that they know really well. It, it could be portfolio accounting, it could be T SQL, what have you. And if you don't know how that, uh, you know, how that works, or you wouldn't know how to create a test, you're gonna have to find somebody to create a test. But just remember, when you hire this person, they're making what, 60, 100,000 a year or something like that. You should be willing to invest 
quite a bit of money to make as, as insurance, think of it as insurance, make sure that that person is qualified, number one, and then they're gonna stay with you for a while, right? It's a, it's a big investment. Not only, it's just a pain in the ass interviewing people all the time, uh, trying to find people. And you know, right now the pandemic's on, there's a lot of people unemployed, but I don't think it's in financial services. And whenever we try to hire somebody here, it takes a while. So um, the, the better job you can do up front to hire the right person and uh, have them stay with you, it'll, it'll pay off dividends. Generally people leave, this is an ENY study, people leave firms because they don't like their boss. So if you're a likable guy and then you just do all this other stuff, people should stay with you for a, a while. So first of all, test your candidates on what they're supposed to know, you know their, their uh, industry knowledge and that sort of stuff. Then for operations, you wanna test and make sure you're getting the right candidates sort of the raw material. So when I was uh, when I was first setting up our firm in India, you know we're hiring uh, you know Indian people. They worked in capital markets, right? Um, what we found was everybody that was coming to us, they wanted to be a portfolio manager. I mean, shoot, we're operations firm. There is no port. There's no way to own a portfolio. Manager. I don't have that job. We don't we don't manage money, right? Um, and you kind of get this in the U.S. as well. When I when I cut my teeth in this industry. Uh, I just took a job in something I was in. I was kind of getting out of my family's uh, nursery business, uh, which I, I hated. So anywhere I went was up. Uh, but I just took a random job working at Pacific Life and Operations, right? And I thought, well, if I just start here, now I'm in like the now I'm in the in the firm that manages money. I'll, I'll I can figure out my way to the you know to become a portfolio manager. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. Right. I mean, if you want to be an analyst, go be an analyst and figure out how to get yourself in to be an analyst. Don't start an operations. It'll just delay your journey. Um, operations is for people. It's also a different skill set, really. There is an analytical part to it, but it's more of an accounting skill set and it's more of an IT type skill set. You want to test candidates that are going to that are going to fit that mold. So we have this Warren's test. Warren is my neighbor and friend, a good friend, run fantasy football together and stuff. He's a PhD in, in industrial psychology, and he comes up with testing so that we match people, the kinds of characteristics of that person to that job function, right? I mean, again, this is like, it doesn't cost that much money. It's 100, 150 bucks a test or something like that. So we set this thing up so that we can hire right the first time, and you're not ending up hiring people that wanna be analysts or that have, you know, they're just gonna be bored in the role. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be something different than what it needs to be. Okay. So you want to test them not only on the industry stuff, but also test them sort of on the raw material. Like does their character lend itself well to this? It all goes back to keeping turnover really low. And then after that, it's, it's really investing in their training, right? You want them to become experts. Our team in India, they all came from capital markets experience. They all worked in, they have their MBAs and finance and all that stuff. That's all well and good. Um, that's good raw material. You, you have to train them. I, on the job training and, and shadowing, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a long, long road to frustration. You, you just need to invest in people, invest in their training. You want them to be the, the experts on that, on that system to help you get the most out of it, right? And also, uh, if they see that you're investing in them, they're going to be happier there. They're going to be more apt to stay with you, assuming you're you know, a nice boss and uh, not a jerk to them. They're going to stay with you a long time. So invest in their training. Uh, you're just going to get a better result uh, from, your, from your operations team from it. All right. Um, I think that's, that's what we, we have uh, for you, what I wanted to cover with you today. So I, I hope this has been interesting. I'll put it up to, to questions. I want to answer uh, you know, any questions or stay as long as, um, you know, as, as you guys would like. But these are areas where you know, I've made mistakes in every one of these things. All right. I've blown it up. A whole bunch. <laughs> so, you know, learn from me. It's all these um, notions are coming from a point of I've done it before. I've done it the bad way. I've learned the, a better way. I wanted to impart it with you. Uh, I mean, uh, operations sometimes is a very thankless job. Uh, so, you know, we got to stick together. And uh, I hope you learned a, a little bit from our, our presentation today. This, this has been terif terrific. There are a lot of uh, real positive comments coming through right now, thanking you for the invitation, thanking uh, you for the presentation. Um, 
there, there's a question that, that hasn't been answered yet. Uh, do you have a moment for, for another sure. question? Definitely. And this is related to cybersecurity. And the question is, how are cybersecurity concerns incorporated into these solutions? And are there methods to, for firms to ensure against these risks? Who is ultimately responsible for cybersecurity risk with third-party vendors? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, every vendor is going to try to put it on you, right? Uh, so when you look into those contracts, um, the end user uh, license, uh, you know, there's, there's the contract that you sign. And then there is generally the end user license, which is on the website as a link, which could change at any time. You know, basically every time you log in, you're signing on to that new contract, right? So um, for the most part, it's pretty easy to identify, um, you know, firms that are, <clears throat> that don't follow good cybersecurity practices. If they're not, if one, uh, if, if they have, um, you know, this is some of the, um, if it's good enough for Goldman Sachs, it's probably good enough for you kind of thing, you know? So if, they're, if a, a big firm is using that same system and you're using the same system and it's a web-based system, more than likely it's fine. Right, not knowing anything else, more than likely you're in the same secure environment that they're in, or substantially similar, and it's it's going to sort of pass muster with the with the basic things, right? You know, they uh, the larger firms get more um, sophisticated around data in that they'll have uh, you know a, a duplicate set of their data somewhere else. Um, they may add multi-factor authentication on top, they may make it mandatory for their users to use multi-factor authentication, whereas the, the typical user doesn't need it. But a lot of these things you can easily turn on, right? So, um, but as far as the contracting go and who owns that risk, you know, they, you gotta read each one. More than likely they try to put it on you, they limit their liability around it, uh, what have you. So um, if you're working with like, you know, if you're getting into building something for you, and it's going to be hosted from AWS. Do your research, right? You, you got some research to do because I mean you're you're really owning it then, right? The Amazon Web Services has a basic set of security in it, right? It's, if you look, it's over HTTPS. You know they have the uh, certificate and all that stuff, but I mean it's kind of you know very entry level. Um, but a lot of the uh, additional security you can very easily add to AWS. But you know you just know that you're going to have to figure that stuff out yourself. I've got one more question here at the moment, um, and perhaps we can make this the last uh, the last question here. And it is what systems does your firm use for providing the investment management services to your clients? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So uh, we have a platform called Tamp One. For that platform, we use Invest Cloud. Invest Cloud is a you know world class software uh, company. J P Morgan uses them. City uses them, uh, huge family offices use them. And so we've had a great relationship with InvestCloud and um, you know, it's wonderful software. So getting back to you know, the earlier part of the presentation, that is a, a, a data warehouse. So it enables us to do a lot of things that typical software um, you, you, just can't, you just can't do. Being able to report on information from uh, across lots of different systems, being able to use that as a single source of truth sort of for, for your data and have it farm, you know, enter in the information one time and have it, it propagate out. So we use InvestCloud um, uh, as, as our main source. Good. Okay, I, I think that's great. Um, All right. People are asking uh, if they'll have an opportunity to get a copy of your slide presentation. Sure. Yeah, we'll send along the slide presentation. We actually, and we have another page with some uh, links to other uh, content that we have that might be useful uh, for you. So we'll, we'll get that out to everybody. And if um, uh, on the slides, we have our, my contact information. If you want to reach out and, and chat, uh, you're welcome to do so. Just, uh, you know, e email me at Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N at Impaxis, or you can call, call the number on the slides. Um, and yeah, I'd be happy to talk with you some more. And if you're, you know, like I said, if you're, if you're still on servers, definitely, definitely call me. I, I will try to cure you of that right way. Well, thank you very much. The Fang thanks you. This has been a terrific presentation. Truly appreciate it. Great. 
Great. Well, thanks, Doug. Thanks, Joyce. Thanks, everybody, for, for joining and uh, signing off for now.